Hello and welcome to this service of worship online with Canyon Lake United Methodist Church. It's a joy to be with you in worship this morning, uh, even at a distance. Uh, so I invite us to join together in our call to worship. God scatters the seeds of reconciliation and love and waits. So much of it lands on flat pathways or rocky roads and won't take root. God scatters the seeds of healing and hope and waits. Shallowness and fear claim the seeds and they cannot live. God scatters the seeds of redemption and peace and waits. These are the places of deep growth where the seed will cast down strong roots. Welcome this day to worship our God who scatters love with reckless abandon. May our hearts be the rich soil in which God's love takes root. Amen. Scattering God, we come to you this day with so many things on our hearts and our minds. Some of the events of this week have been very positive and caused us to celebrate, but we are constantly besieged by worries, doubts, and fears. These negative things crowd out your word, and we become like the useless soil unable to receive and grow. Slow us down. Continue to pour your love on us because we really hunger and thirst 
for your love. Forgive us when we allow all of the negativity to drown out your word. Scatter again the seeds of peace, of love, of hope, and joy, that we might be better disciples for you in this world, which is in so much pain. We pray and we offer our own prayers of silent confession this time. Hear the good news. God will never stop showering us with God's love. All the time, in every place, God is always for us, nurturing us to grow deep roots and to bear fruit. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Alleluia. Amen. And as we prepare to hear the word read and proclaimed, let us offer our prayer of illumination. O oh Lord, help us to hear you and grow in us greater understanding this day. May your word find in us good soil in which to take root, that we might bear fruit abundantly in your kingdom, where love is is the law. Amen. That day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, that some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and they ate them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang, sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But the sun rose, and they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty.
That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat. And he sat there while the whole crowd stood around on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Well, it should come as no surprise to most of you that I am a city boy. <laughs> I was raised in, on the north side of San Antonio. Uh, the uh, nearest, uh, the nearest farm, uh, by my uh, understanding, was uh, was the local grocery store. Um, but thankfully, I've had the opportunities to uh, to serve in some communities, some farming and ranching communities, and to learn a little bit along the way uh, about what happens before uh, our food makes it to the grocery store. Um, and so one of the things that I have learned about farming is uh, about the tractors. Being a city boy, uh, a couple of times a year I would go out to my grandparents, uh, at my grandparents' place and uh, they had one of these old uh, rusted red, uh, I don't know if it was red before it was rusted, but it was certainly red when I saw it, red rust uh, tractors. Uh, just sitting out in the back 40, uh, and I don't believe it ever moved in the entire time uh, that I uh, visited out there. Uh, it was not a very big tractor. Um, and uh, so that's, that's kind of the concept of what I had in my mind for, for tractors. But things have changed since then. Uh, when I served in, in Woodsboro, uh, there was an active farming community, especially of cotton and sorghum. And uh, they started to tell me about their tractors. Um, they're pretty high tech. Uh, they had air conditioning. Uh, you always think of the, the farmer out there in, in the heat, and they certainly are. Uh, but that, that, uh, uh, that tractor had air conditioning. They had a, some of them had even a CD player inside. Um, and they had all sorts of great, uh, fancy electronics. They had GPS that knew where the tractor was, knew where the fields were, knew where the rows were. In fact, the GPS would guide uh, the driver to turn the tractor to just the right place to line up with the next uh, set of rows uh, to uh, uh, whether it was planting or harvesting. And uh, when it came to seeds, uh, you know, they didn't just plant one or two rows at a time. They had these huge, long lines of, uh, of seed bucket, seed planters uh, that would uh, plant the seed to just the right depth uh, and just the right distance between uh, each seed. Uh, it, um, it was quite an operation. Lots of planning went into it uh, because there was a lot of money involved in farming. Uh, it took a lot of money for that equipment in order to raise that crop, uh, in order to prepare the soil. There were there was fertilizers and fungicides and pesticides, all of those things. Uh, and in fact, the tractors were so uh, so advanced that during harvest time, uh, as 
uh, the combine or the, the harvester was going through the crops, uh, it could actually measure in real time the amount of yield uh, that was occurring at different points uh, in the field. So there might be a portion of someone's field that wasn't, uh, wasn't growing uh, good crops, didn't have good soil, and they would try to figure out uh, what to do uh, to give extra attention to that part of the field so that it uh, would, would bear more crops in the next season. Uh, it was very exacting. There was a lot of science behind it. And there really, there has to be. Because you don't make a profit without carefully managing the scarce resources. I mean, there's a constant worry about an un, uh, a constant worry about an un certain harvest. Lots of concern about when the rain comes. Well, we, we need a quarter inch the first part of next week. We need, uh, boy, we, we, we got just enough before the crop went in or, oh, heaven forbid there'd be lots of rain right before the cotton was supposed to be uh, harvested because uh, that was always um, a big problem. And these this scarcity mindset was driven because, uh, because it did cost so much and their lives were so much on the line. And because when the crop didn't have a good yield, when it didn't come in well, there was, there was a call that would come to come in and speak to the bank. And that was not a call and not a meeting that any farmer ever wanted to have, but happened more uh, than anyone than anyone would have wanted. The whole mindset, the exactingness, the, the throughout the season of, of growth, there's great anxiety about how the crop will turn out. This comes from really a, a mindset of scarcity that there won't be enough harvest or that there won't be enough harvest for them in relation to others and the price will go down and so there won't be enough profit. Um, it's a scarcity mindset. I think recently we're feeling scarcity in a whole new kind of way. All of this, uh, it's not just the scarcity of toilet paper or things at the grocery store, uh, although that's part of it. It's also the scarcity of just interactions with others. The scarcity of the things that we've taken for granted of how we live our lives and how much they've changed and how, uh, how those things now seem to be in such short supply and how we long to gather again. We long to hug. We long to shake hands again. And so here we read this parable. We hear Jesus tell this story, the parable of the sower. The sower just casts the seed about everywhere, casts it on the path, on the rocks, on the thorns, as well as the good soil. You would never catch uh, one of those farmers in Woodsboro uh, doing anything like that. Uh, everything was measured. Everything had its place. But this is a parable of sower who is reckless, careless even, extravagantly so, casting seed in abundance, not scarcity. Of course, the seed that Jesus is talking about is the word of God, the way of God, the love of God, the future and hope with God. And we know that God's love endures forever. And therefore, there is abundance. It's not only from an abundant harvest, but it's also a planting in abundance. The harvest, in fact, is certain, regardless of the weather. God's kingdom will come, not by our own effort, but our efforts are important. 
We can't lose sight of the generosity of God, casting about for all to receive. Season upon season, each time an opportunity, uh, each time an opportunity to grow, an invitation to grow. How different that is than the way that we so often approach the world. How often we approach the world when we say things and we think things like, I will forgive this person only if they say they're sorry. Uh, only if they're sincere. Oh, I'll help someone, but only if they've broken no laws or if they show me that they can make good choices. And that should be... Basically, I'll help someone if they deserve it. We often find ourselves speaking in this kind of way. But you know, it's not really love if they in fact did deserve it. The Lord tells us that none of us deserved it. And yet God forgives recklessly, serves generously, and loves with abandon. You know, one of the things I think about this scripture is that there's the temptation when we read this uh, to spend our energy asking a kind of a question like, well, what kind of soil am I? Am I in? Am I out? Am I the one who is plucked up on the path? Am I the one that, that, that uh, withered in the sun? Am I the one that uh, was choked out by the bushes? What if instead the point of this parable was to learn about the nature of God? God the sower, this reckless sower this one who loves with abandon. Maybe this scripture, I just wonder, maybe if it's not intended to be a gauge of faithfulness. What if it just describes a reality, the seed that falls on the path as it does? There's, uh, it, the seed that falls on the path, you know, some don't understand. And it's snatched away by the evil one. Some of the seed, inevitably, even in our own lives, falls in the rocky areas where there's immediate joy, things we're excited about. And then, given time or perhaps distraction, we look, we lack the roots, and we fall away. And the thorns. You know, sometimes we hear, but we get lured away by something else shiny in the world. And then there's the good soil. And it says that there's hearing. Jesus says that there's hearing and understanding and that that, that good soil leads to bearing fruit. We could reflect on this we should reflect on this, but not to lose sight that the word, the seed, is a gift. It's a gift from God, and it's to nurture us and all in the life of faith. I have with me here a wonderfully homegrown tomato by uh, one of the members of our congregation. And uh, it reminded me of a tomato from just just a couple of years ago. Uh, I got a, a tomato just slightly larger than this one, and and I was curious in reading this scripture, and so I I sectioned the tomato. I, I took I sort of took it all apart uh, in order to count the seeds that were inside. Took those seeds, I, I dried them, and I, so that I counted them accurately and. While it may not look much here in front of you, uh, it turns out there were 354 seeds in one tomato. 
I don't think that's probably the same for every tomato, but and the tomato I counted, 354 seeds. I still have them. I have them because I didn't want to have to count them again uh, another time. But this one tomato has 354 seeds. In the scripture, Jesus talks about, uh, about bearing fruit, about the seed uh, being planted in the good soil and bearing good fruit. Think about the abundance that Jesus is talking about. That one seed, one seed could grow a plant and that that plant would have you know, many tomatoes on it. And each of these tomatoes would have a multitude of seeds, 350 or more, and so each one of them could then grow another plant. Thousands upon thousands of tens of thousands and more of seeds. The harvest is plentiful when the fruit, when we bear fruit. Jesus, in speaking in this way, is seeking to call us to a reordering of our lives. He's calling us to live differently. Our lives have to change, uh, not just our minds, not just in how we think or, or what we assent to, or uh, not just in how we think others should live, but actually how we live life differently because we have encountered God and God has changed our lives and is changing our lives. God has shown us abundance of life, of love, an abundance of justice, an abundance of community. And of course, any real change that's going to happen in our lives will cost in some way. Chapter 12, verse 11 of Hebrews says, Now discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And today's scripture tells us that when God's word takes root in the soil in our lives, it bears fruit a hundredfold. When we are faithful, with patient endurance. Endurance is a painful process. It's a costly process. A costly process of, of applying discipline, practices, habits over a long period of time. Much like in this moment as we've been distancing for month after month, and it continues. The goal of our Christian practices, our Christian discipline, over the course of a lifetime, our goal is to live into God's abundant life, that it requires us to develop practices and habits that we do in response to God's abundant love for us. You know, of course, any real change isn't just about the bringing of something new. True change, true growth, is at least as much, if not more, about something, something that is old, that needs to fall away, something that needs to fall apart in order to make room for the new beginning. transformation begins to take place. Our eyes are, begin to be open. We begin to hear where God's call. When we wake up that the old way is no longer life-giving like we thought it was. We have to let go before we can begin anew. I have a feeling that with this experience of COVID that there will be a lot that we have to give up a lot that we have to think of anew. 
There will be things that we already have begun mourning and grieving of loss. And we should also take a moment to think, what are the things that this gives us the opportunity to let go of? The opportunity to make a change, an opportunity to let something in our life that was not life-giving, to let it go, to let it fade away so that new life can take root. In being intentional about anything, we have to be careful about what we choose to pay attention to in our lives. Do we focus only on the negative? Do we look for shocking and only negative news? Do we indulge in the sniping uh, uh, that dehumanizes others? And especially, as we're all prone to do, the sniping that dehumanizes those with whom we disagree. When that's our focus, is it any wonder that we seem to just wither up and lose all hope? Like some bird has flown in and snatched up our Jesus. Some thorny bush is choking out all the fun in life. We don't stumble into God's way by accident. It's a choice of living. It's a discipline, a practice. We have to turn our eyes to God, yes, but as a way of orienting our lives to the North Star, the North Star of our lives, the way, the truth, and the life, the abundant life. It's not a one-time thing. It's the kind of thing that Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction, living out the practices that till the soil of our spiritual lives. That's discipleship. That till the soils of our lives in relationship with others. You see, God's grace enables us to turn to God to reorient our lives and to live out our practice, our habits that help us to walk in the light of God's love so that we can be followers of the way. You know, there's plenty of the birds and the brambles and the withering sun in our lives. Where do you see the good soil? Where do you see things taking root and growing? Where are you ready to cultivate some more of that good soil, to listen, to understand God's gift of this reckless love? And let it bear fruit in your life. How about in the relationship you have with your spouse or your significant other? What habits do you have to foster good soil for growth and abundant life? Love is more than a feeling, of course. It takes work, especially when tempers flare and when times get hard and when you've been in the house together for month after month together. One of the key relationship experts, somebody that really studies this with a scientific eye, a psychologist named John Gottman, he says that it takes five positive encouragements for every one negative comment said when couples fight. He calls it the magic ratio. Relationships that weather the storms and that make it for the long term are the kinds that engage and encourage far more than they criticize. Maybe you have a habit to develop, to experience God's abundant life, and to share that love with those closest to you. I'll close by telling a story from my life. One morning, it's probably when I was in middle school, I was eating breakfast cereal at the kitchen table as I did every day. And uh, when my dad said goodbye to leave for work, uh, as he always did, Uh, looked just a little before my ride for school came, I noticed that my mom went to the front picture window of the house and she stood there. 
She stood there um, and waited and watched as Dad backed out of the driveway into the, into the street, uh, began his way, and then he would lean down and he would wave, and Mom would wave back and would blow him a kiss. I could see Dad inside the car looking back at Mom, waving and blowing kisses to her as well. I have to say that as a teen, I wasn't completely grossed out by that. But I asked mom about it, and she said, well, I do it every day. Here I was in middle school, and I was just noticing. She said, this is one of the ways that I let your dad know that I love him and that I know that he loves me. Folks, there's a, there's a habit to put in the relationship bank. There's soil to be tilled, a seed to carefully be planted and cultivated and nourished that, is, has ingrown, that in this case has grown to bear fruit for more than 53 years. God blesses us with love, when we receive it fully in our lives, when we reorient our lives around God's love as a gift, we cultivate these habits and practices and nourish our faith, we experience abundant life, fruitful for our generation, far beyond our own. Generation upon generation. Let's cultivate good soil, the abundant life, that it might bear fruit for all to enjoy. For we know a reckless, loving God who sows with abandon that all might receive God's love, that that love might take root and grow into beautiful fruit. Amen. In this time of social distancing, it is ever more important that we give thanks to God and find ways to connect with one another. Here are some ways that you can practice your generosity with your financial gifts and also some ways that you can connect with your church family during this time. You can find these links in the video description below.
remind you that every Sunday at 11 a.m. we gather online for a kind of a community check-in uh, and a sharing of our prayer requests. It is so wonderful to see each other and to connect in this time. You can join, whether by video or by audio, uh, using your computer or your smartphone. Uh, you can even call in uh, and participate uh, by voice and listening as well. The community check-in is a posted event on our Facebook page each uh, weekend uh, for each Sunday. And the details are also in the weekly e-news. You can find this week's link and the call-in credentials to join the gathering using Zoom. Again, on our Facebook page and in the weekly e-news. I encourage you to take part in this. Uh, each week, I find it a heartwarming experience uh, to see us gathered, uh, at least in part, uh, and to share uh, how our lives are and to be united in love. Now, let us pray. O oh God, who plants seeds of hope, of love, and of justice within our lives, we are so grateful for this community of faith and for all anywhere who hunger or thirst for your healing, reconciling word. You know all the things that are on our hearts today, and you bring us together in love and support. We ask your healing mercies with those who struggle with illness of every kind, especially those uh, affected by the pandemic. And for all who feel, have feelings of being lost and marginalized. For those who mourn and for those for whom the darkness of sorrow enshrouds them. We ask your growth producing love for all those who celebrate and rejoice this day. Be with each one of us and all whom we have named in our hearts before you. Help us to reach out to each other in compassion and support, to forgive one another, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. into this week, uh, seeking to hear, to understand this reckless sower of love of a God that we have.
May that love find fertile soil in our lives. May we grow in that love and may the fruit uh, that comes from it uh, be a part of God's redeeming work in this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.